Hello, class. So this is almost the last lecture of the final. So organic uh, speciation, and uh, hopefully you will finish up. I will finish it up in uh, less than an hour. I hope uh, we'll see how that goes. Okay. So uh, you all know what organic means. Uh, molecules that have carbon to carbon. You learned it in biology one. Uh, molecules that have carbon to carbon bond, uh, covalent bond, or carbon to hydrogen covalent bond. And that, is, that molecule is classified as organic. Now, speciation, <laughs> that's what we are going to talk about in this chapter. Uh, hopefully, you will uh, know what speciation means at the end of the hour, I hope. Okay, my PowerPoint's working. Okay, let me, while I'm here, I did that fixed, you know? Okay. No, thank you. Oh. And, and, no, I have no clue. Why is not working? Sorry. Hmm. Let's see if this works. Maybe I need battery. Huh. Okay. I guess I have to, we have to go without uh, battery a little bit, sorry. So, uh, uh, an overview of speciation. Uh, uh, what did Darwin propose? That's what this whole entire hour is going to be about uh, these things. Uh, this is a rundown of uh, what I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, number one, what did Darwin propose? And then what is population evol evolution? And what did new species originated? How did they originate it? And what would be the phylogeny and tree of life? So that's pretty much what uh, we'll talk about for the next, uh, next one hour. Evolution can be defined by Darwin as a phrase of descendant with modification. So that means when the future offsprings are modified to some extent, and that modification is based on the nature. That's pretty much what Darwin was trying to say, and that's natural selection. Okay, that nature that I'm gonna that I, that I, I said that could be a predator, that could be weather, it could be a disease, it could be a variety of things. Okay, so uh, the environment made these modifications of the descendant. Uh, the, the future offsprings possible. Speciation is a pattern and not a process, and, and a pro is a pattern and a process both. Prior to Darwin, Earth was viewed as young uh, and inhabited by unchanging species. So that's how it was pretty much, but um, Darwin came up with a book of origin of species and then um, Steel is in print, and one of my former students got a copy of it, and uh, after she read it, she gave it to me, but anyhow. Uh, there are four types of data that uh, document the pattern of speciation, uh, direct observations, homology, and fossil records, and biogeography, which I will, I need to talk about all uh, four of these. I will talk about all four of them, uh, and uh, each one of them. You know, what Darwin proposed, um, there was at his time, uh, Darwin on the left and uh, uh, Wallace uh, is on the right. What did Darwin uh, propose? It coincided at the same time with Wallace. And they had no idea, uh, somebody else that is proposing what they are proposing. And they met in a conference. And in that conference, of course, they said, ah, I, I'm saying this, I'm saying the same thing. And of course, um, uh, well, anyhow, I don't want to get into too, uh, too much. And uh, Wallace uh, said to Darwin, you go ahead and go ahead and publish it and take care of it and do all of the other work he did in mind. 
and Darwin did, but and Darwin got, of course, his name is known to everybody, um, but not Wallace. Uh, Wallace is um, he proposed the same thing, but of course, I don't know how much afterward, um, uh, after that, Wallace have done uh, regarding the evolution. But anyway, origin of Darwin's theory of evolution, Lamarckism. Uh, they say this, I don't know if this is true or not, the day that Lamarck died, uh, the same day Darwin, uh, or same year, I can't remember, same year Darwin was born. So, and, I, and we need to visit what Darwin, what Lamarck said, uh, inheritance of acquired uh, characteristics. So use and disuse uh, drives evolution. That's what Lamarck was saying. Organism strives to meet demands of the environment. So, and acquired adaptations individually and then pass them to offsprings. Individual organisms uh, transform their characteristics to produce evolution, and all organisms have an innate drive to become more complex. Uh, not accepted uh, by nowadays uh, based on genetics. Of course, Lamarck did not know genetics, Darwin did not know the laws of genetics. And then, um, so they made these remarks, both uh, Lamarck and Darwin, uh, not knowing the genetics. Um, so anyhow, this is uh, the, okay, in fact, uh, classic Lamarckism, the giraffe evolved, they got the long neck because the food was on top of the tree. While Darwin said something else, I hope I have the uh, PowerPoints in here. Uh, over. Uh, many generations, the changes accumulate to produce the long neck, and many people still believe an unsupported idea and confuse it. Here we go. Okay, so what is uh, what did Lamarck propose? That right here is the um, the giraffes are looking at the food on top of the tree, and over generations, the neck becomes longer and longer and longer. What did Darwin propose? He said, "Yeah, the food was on top of the tree." And some giraffes neck was taller, some smaller, like here. Uh, and then the smaller uh, giraffe that they were, uh, they, the neck was not long enough. What happened? They died right here on this diagram. I better get something going on. Right here, they died in this population right here. So what Darwin was proposing that organisms evolved based on the population. Okay, that's a big difference between uh, Darwin and Lamarck, the biggest difference, put it this way. Lamarck said, no, it was individual organisms that evolved and they developed, the, the neck becomes longer. Okay, Darwin said, no, it was a population. So that's what, and based on genetics, the laws of genetics that we know now, that is accepted now. Uh, that is uh, not what Lamarck said, what Darwin said. Darwin and Wallace, I should say Darwin and Wallace. But just for short, I say Darwin for now. Origins of uh, Darwin evolution theory, Darwin versus Lamarckism. Now this PowerPoint, now this slide is comparing Darwin um, Differs from Lamarck's as being in the a variation, not a transformation. So, um, Darwin said it's variation, and Lamarck said it's transformation. Evolution occurs in population. That's what Darwin proposed. Evolution changes is caused by the differential survival and reductions among organisms with advantage traits and survival of the fittest. So the, the fittest one that survived, they, uh, the, one, the one that did not fit, the one that did not have a long neck, they had short neck, they died, okay? But the one that had long neck, and of course Darwin did not know the laws of Mendel's, they are the one who transmitted, who gave their uh, genes to the next generation. And most likely those genes had also long neck, okay? So, that's pretty much desirable traits accumulated, okay, um, and got passed on uh, to the next generation. That's what I said. Okay, a little bit of Darwin. Uh, what did Darwin uh, propose? And his, uh, he, of course, at the beginning, based on what I read, uh, 
he was going to become a medical doctor and then he decided to become a, a minister. He went to monastery for a while. I think a year or so he went to medical school. And then finally he changed his mind and he went to the University of London as far as I know, I think. Uh, and then he studies in, uh, naturally. So uh, there's a degree called natural biology, something like that. And then uh, of course he became a naturalist. Of course his father and his family was rich. And then uh, what happened, he, um, did not, he uh, one of his friends uh, was a captain of a ship. He said, well, I'll, do you want to go on this voyager uh, for five years? I think it was for five years, four years, five years. And then of course they don't pay you, but during, during those days, uh, any, any voyager that went, uh, the British uh, uh, ships that went from island to island, they also took a naturalist with them. Okay, so study the nature of the habitats they are uh, going to. So Darwin went in there and I'll, I'll, as far as I know, he did not get paid for it, but of course the room on board was free for five years. So he went on and collected his data and his information. Charles Darwin, he was born in 1809 and died in 1882, uh, uh, presented the first uh, credential, uh, credible uh, explanation of evolution and changes. And then of course made uh, extensive uh, collection and observation in five years voyage, it's called the Beagle Images Beagle. Okay, these are his observations. These are what Darwin uh, found out uh, and of course, oh, sorry. And then uh, members of the population have a heritable variation. So of course, as I said, he did not know about uh, genetics, the Mendel's law. And it's amazing. I uh, will talk about that, that uh, Mendel proposed his ideas mid 1800s, 1850s and so on and so forth. And of course, Darwin proposed his idea of natural selection mid 1500s, 1850s, okay, 1850s. And then, uh, scientists did not put them together until early 1900. In early 1900, scientists put them together. What did Mendel propose? What did Darwin propose? Put them together and they came up with synthetic theory of evolution, which I will talk about that uh, later on a little bit. So he, but of course, Darwin, Darwin knew about, knew about, knew about uh, uh, you know, population will transform their genes to the next generation. In a population, more individuals are uh, uh, produced each generation than it can survive and reproduce. Of course, the number of the eggs and sperm we make is much, much more than uh, actually human being or any other species are made. Some individuals have adaptive characteristics that enable to, uh, them to survive and reproduce better than the others. Some giraffes had short neck, they could not survive. Some people do not have the, uh, the gene to survive HIV, for example. But some people have the gene to survive HIV. So anyhow, and increasing uh, proportions of individual in um, succeeding generations have the adaptive characteristics due to the genetic inheritance of the trait. Okay. And then the last one, uh, the result of natural selection in a population uh, adapted, uh, adapted to it. Okay, Darwin theory of evolution, uh, perpetual changes. It means the changes constantly occur. It doesn't stop at one time. And uh, you will see that the changes on earth is going to happen to us. So main uh, premise of Darwin evolution, the world is neither constant nor perpetually cycling, it's not cycling, but it's changing. It's always changing with uh, hereditary continu uh, continuity from past to present. Evidence by fossils, so what supports that idea? And of course, uh, Darwin uh, collected fossils and studied uh, fossils, not only he collected, he studied them as well. So um, based on fossil records, he came up with these ideas. Um, uncovered the crust of the earth, uh, can be complete remains, insects, embers. Um, so it's just not the fossil, of course, the bone digger from the ground. 
it's also insects in ambers and uh, mammoth frozen in ice and you know actual um, hard parts of the uh, teeth and bones and uh, petrified uh, skeleton parts of infused with silica or uh, other minerals. So there is a park. If you go to um, uh, uh, Saint Helena in California, the city of Saint Helena, there is a museum. There is a store outside of it. It has a lot of plants that have been petrified uh, in there. Uh, it means that plants got stuck in the stones, and you know, um, and then you can either buy them, or they sell them for you, to you. Uh, forms cast impression of fossil experiments and then uh, any, anything like that it is. Evolutionary trends, fossil uh, records allows observation of evolutionary change over a broader period of time. The trend, and I will talk about extinctions later on, uh, trends are directional change in future and diversity of organisms animal species repeatedly arise and become extinct throughout the history. And uh, so that means we human are gonna become extinct someday. Okay, so, but we came to earth new. We just came to mother earth. So animal species typically survive on average, based on the fossil records, yeah, on average they survive one to 10 million years. And we human have not been here even a million years. Uh, but their duration is highly variable, but on average. Fossil trends uh, clearly uh, demonstrate Darwin's principle of perpetual um, evolution. Here is an example of adaptation. Um, so if I have some, this is adaptation to, uh, of tuberculosis. Uh, so if in a, in a test tube, I have uh, bacteria and I pour some antibiotic on them, and then they, it kills them all except a few, a few survives. And I take those few and put it in another test tube and I put a different type of antibiotic on them. They all die except a few. Put them in the next test tube, test tube and same thing. So that is called adaptation. And soon if I put a cocktail of all of these antibiotics, different antibiotics on top of them, then what will happen? Oh, I found the battery, aha. Uh -huh. Okay, maybe I should pause a little bit because, um, let me pause. This meeting is being recorded. No, the battery is too big for this guy. I got to get a smaller battery, but anyhow. So um, that's called adaptation. So adaptation, it means uh, the best example we have for, I have for that one as the uh, resistance to tuber tuberculosis, okay? And that's part of the evolution. The next one is homology. So Darwin made his observations based on homology. Homology means similarity. Similarity is between two species. So Darwin saw uh, homology as a major evidence for a common descendant. So the parents uh, had a common descendant, you know, great grandparents. Richard Owen describes homology as the same organ in different organisms under every variety of form and function. And I'll show you some pictures and then we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the vertebrates a limb show the same basic structures modified in different functions. You will see that every time a new feature arises on an evolutionary lineage, a new homology forms. Homology gets transmitted to all descendant lineage unless there is, uh, un unless it is uh, subsequently lost. Okay. So let's show pictures right here. Okay, so if you look at the limbs of a human right here, and um, then you look at the bat's wing, you look at uh, Propius, uh, the uh, fin, a horse's leg and frog's leg, they all have the yellow parts and the uh, blue parts they all have similarities, okay? So what did scientists say are still saying that possibly they had a common ancestor based on these similarities between the legs of the frog and human and, and then uh, hands and then the bat's wing and 
papyrus fin and horse's leg, they all had a common ancestor. And that is homology, okay? Another portion of homology, if you look at human embryo and chick's embryo, they have post-anal tail. Remember, we talked about post-anal tail in the last lecture, uh, the vertebrate animals. So when we were in other mo our mother's womb, we did have a post-anal tail right here. We had it. Right now, we don't have, have one. Uh, it's reduced to coccyx. We studied that first exam material. And then, of course, the pharyngeal uh, pouches, the pharyngeal gill slits, we had them when we were in other mother's womb, but now we have lungs, okay? And same as chicks embryo. So based on that, um, like um, notochord, we had notochord, chicks have notochord as well. But right now we have vertebral column. At embryonic stages, we had notochord. So... Then another thing about convergent evolution. Convergent evolution is the evolution of similar or analogous features uh, in distant, distantly related groups. So analogy, for example, uh, birds fly with the wings and then flies, a mosquito flies with their wings. A dragonfly flies with their wings. That's an analogy. They're, they both have wings, they both are flying, but they didn't have a common ancestor. So what does convergent evolution say is that on an island, in some area, somewhere, the natural pressure came, let's say predator. So the mice over a period of time learned how to fly and became bat. And then the ant over a period of time because of the natural selection was same on both of them, on mice and on ants. So the mice became bat, learned how to fly away from the predator, and the ants learned how to fly away from the same predator, same natural selection to fly and like a fly or mosquito. But they had no, they had no um, common ancestor. So, Analogous traits arise when groups independently adapted to similar environment or in similar ways. Convergent evolution does not provide information about ancestry, okay? And similar functions, but not common ancestor figure. Okay, fossil records, a lot of information has been gathered about fossil records. And as I said, one to 10 million on average organisms disappear. Uh, it's based on fossil records. And you know that fossil records, you guys, it's a trilobita. Remember, it's a um, uh, subphylum of arthropoda. You remember we talked about it. The fossil records provides evidence of extinction, extinctions of species, uh, the origin of new groups and changes within groups over time. Most mammals were terrestrial, and uh, some moved to the land, uh, to the water. So the whales, the dolphins, that they are mammals and they are in, in water right now, uh, they are saying possibly they were living in land and something happens. So they move to the sea and of course they're still mammals. Um, okay, so do not worry about exam five. During, uh, when we were in person, I broke the, I broke the exam, uh, I broke these uh, chapters uh, into the evolution throughout the semester. So the next one is biogeography. So the biogeography, the scientists study uh, of the ge geographic distribution of species and then uh, Pangaea, make sure you know what that term means. Of course, very significant. Um, Pangaea means the earth at one time was all one piece. And because of the uh, earth crust shifts a little bit and still shifting, okay. Um, but it seems like it, at one time it happened suddenly. It's not gradual right now. Uh, so the earth, one piece of the land was separated, but have since separated by uh, continental uh, drifts and 200 million years ago. So the earth that we are seeing right now, the continent, the way they are, it's been like this for the past 200 million years ago. But at one time it was all one. So. 
about 20 million years ago, the earth is uh, uh, present day, I'm sorry, 20 million years ago, 20, 200, what happened? Continental drift happened 200 million years ago. And as I said, constantly changing, but the present earth we have is 20 million years ago. And I possibly will not ask you these things about time, but again, you should have a good idea uh, as far as the changes of the um, Earth, the shift, the uh, continental shift happens. Okay, so you remember somewhere along the line in the semester, I talked about Toxoplasma gondii, and Toxoplasma gondii it will kill kangaroos and wallabies, right? So that is a good indication that Toxoplasma gondii was spread out throughout the Earth, and organisms adapted. So they didn't die off of it. But kangaroos and wallabies, the marsupials in Australia, they were excluded from this spread of the disease throughout the earth. So now they are getting exposed to it. Of course, they're dying. Do you remember I talked about the line of evolution? At first, it was parasitism and commensalism and then mutualism. You remember we talked about this? There was a line, parasitism, commensalism, mutualism. So right now, the Toxoplasma gondii and wallabies are in their parasitic stage and of course they die. We are still, Toxoplasma gondii still is a parasite, but we are in between, we are somewhere in here, getting close to commensalism. Okay, so that's what it is with marsupials and what happens with kangaroos and Toxoplasma gondii. Um, biogeography continue, endemic species or native species are species that are not found anywhere else in the world. So that's the definition of endemic species. Uh, islands have many endemic species. They are often closely related to species in the nearest uh, uh, mainland. So for example, you have Galapagos Islands in here, you have Galapagos Islands in here, but you have the mainland here. So what happens, the species in here, oops, sorry, the species, species in here, the species in here, they are different from each other, but they have some similarities with the species in the mainland because the species from mainland, they either by water or flu, when they went over to these islands, and of course, over a period of time, because the conditions in those islands were different, they were modified. However, there are some similarities between the species in these islands, island A and island B. Okay? With the mainland. That's what he's saying, the Galapagos Islands. That's what Darwin went and looked at it. Species from the mainland settled in the islands and became species uh, adapted to the new environment. Uh, finches in Galapagos Islands. So that's what Darwin noticed that the finches in Galapagos Islands on top of the tree and bottom of the tree, there are different finches. The bottom of the tree, the beak is longer, digging to the ground. The one on top of the tree or lower tree, the beaks are shorter. Okay. And then he found some similarities with the beaks of the mainland. Okay, changes of allele species. Now we're getting to genetics a little bit of allele species on the following and non-random uh, non mating, migration and genetic drift and mutation and uh, natural selection eventually. Oh, let's go back. Okay, so I wanna talk about this a little bit. Um, changes of allele frequencies depends on the following, the population. Um, I will talk about, I did uh, talk about Hardy Weinberg in bio one. So now we are come, he, he, coming here and complete the cycle. Uh, and bio one, I just throw it at you say, this is it, I showed you how to drive the equation, how to come up uh, with the equation, P square plus two PQ plus Q square equal to one. I showed you how to drive that equation. Now, I don't, this semester, I will not show it to you, but I will talk about it, how uh, that fits a population. 
So non-random mating. So the animals that are in the nature or us, we are non-random mating, okay? And migration, genetic drift. I, I, I got to show you pictures because with these, it does not uh, show up. So that's, that, 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 makes, I'm gonna, that makes the population uh, homogeneous, I hope. Uh, it, it does not change the population uh, genetics. Again, I'm trying to explain something that uh, if I show you later on, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, what is microevolution? Okay, the evolution changes in a population, small scale of evolution, and that is uh, based on the, the factors, the five things that I mentioned before, that is uh, uh, microevolution, causes a microevolution. Changes in allele frequencies in a population over generations, three main uh, mechanisms that cause allele frequency change, natural selection, of course, genetic drift, and uh, the last one is a gene flow, which I need to talk about all of it. The natural selection, you guys, uh, I will uh, talk about it. So I'm not going to get into great detail anymore, uh, but just you have the great idea to know what is a natural selection. If you don't, please holler at me and let's talk about it. Formation of new allele by mutation, of course, you study that in bio one. You know, the, you know, it's, the changes in the DNA sequence. A lot of times we've seen it, we see it in bacteria all the time that they, the environment changes. I told you an example adaptation with uh, um, tuberculosis. Okay, so when the changes occur, the genome, the genetic sequence of the bacteria, some of them change and they adapt, they have the gene but they can modify it and adapt to the antibiotic. So formation of a new one. Uh, altering uh, gene uh, number or positions, uh, rapid reproductions, sexual reproductions, crossing over independent isomer. Of course, these are we studied in biology one that can contribute to uh, you know, the survival of the fittest. You know, the, the species we can uh, adapt to the environment, they can survive. So gene pool is very fluid because of uh, wars, diseases, traveling, et cetera. And, uh, you know, you know, gene pool is the number of all of the uh, alleles in a population of all of the genes in a population is called the gene pool. We choose our mate not based on blood type, but based on physical appearance, ethnic background, intelligence, and shared interests, right? We do not choose our base. Uh, we do not go and asking what is your blood type? So what is uh, non-random mating? So we are uh, choosing our mates randomly. If you were, it was on based on a blood type, that would be non-random. Okay, so, um, but we choose our mates. So it is a random type of thing uh, to some extent. And to some extent it's non-random, I don't know. Um, I'm confusing or not, this is always be confusing. So it's a, it's a double edge, it's a, it's a combination of both. Non-random mating occurs when certain individuals contribute more to next generation than others. Uh, for example, semen from a uh, price bowl uh, is used uh, to um, inseminate cows. As a result, you have that in dogs, in bulls, in all of the animals uh, that they, the farmers used to breed or the animal breeders used to breed, and that is called non-random mating, okay? But for us human, um, it is more of a random. It can, non-random can, has a factor, has play in it in human, but it's more of a non-random. Right here, so he's telling a population that uh, everything, uh, everything is equal in that population. And then you find a bowl that has the prize bowl, it has this type of gene. And then what will happen when you uh, introduce that semen uh, into the population of the uh, females, then of course, right here, you have more of it. I hope I'm making some sense. 
and that's a non-random. What is migration? Large cities um, have a migration of different ethnicities into them, uh, decline when alleles frequencies gradually differ from one neighboring population to the next neighboring population. Usually people who cannot co uh, communicate do not have children. Uh, if I go to China, I don't think I will have any children there. Uh, Klein, for example, can be observed on Nine River and uh, what else did I say? In America, there is a greater genetic change uh, from north to south than east to west. Um, during lecture, I used to explain those, uh, but if you look at the population of uh, the continent of North America, you will see from all the way from Canada, all the way to uh, down south in Brazil, uh, Chile, uh, the, there is a great variation of the population of humans. But if you look at east to west, like United States, look at east to west, there is not much variation. Okay, so I hope. Um, and that's what that sentence means. And then the client on the Nile, it's um, the group of people who live on the Nile, uh, they are uh, the one who close to each other, they are similar, but the one from top of the Nile to the end of the Nile, they are different genetically. That's pretty much what that is saying. Okay, here is migration. What happens, you have, again, you have a population. You have a population right here. And then what happens, you know, uh, the circle and the square uh, are infused into this population. And then as a result, you have a population with more of square and um, circle. That's migration. Migration, however, is completely different than genetic drift. Genetic drift is when a small group separated from a large population. And I'll show you this separated group reproduce among themselves. Genetic drift uh, occurs because of population size increases, natural disasters, geographic barriers, isolate people or human behavior. Uh, the Basque people was an, a good example of that in Spain. They, uh, they just a few years back, they asked for independence in the go. And they have in Spain, they have a certain blood type and so on and so forth. Let's look at the diagram. So here's a diagram. You have a population right here. And then what happens, a few of these people, they will go ahead and migrate to a different part of, and they breed among themselves. In, if you would, right here, these, these people who migrated, they will breed with these people here. Okay, I hope I'm making some sense. That's not the case with genetic drift. The genetic drift, they, a group of that population right here migrated here and they are breeding among themselves. Okay, that's called genetic drift. Make sure you know those differences. And then uh, uh, the, what is founder effect? Founder effect is a type of genetic uh, uh, drift when some human leaves home to find new settlements, example, some of the uh, Christ of Latter-day uh, Saints in Utah, French Canadian population in Quebec, uh, Dunkers community in Germantown, Pennsylvania, Amish people, and uh, Mennonites of Lancaster County in Pennsylvania. All of these are examples of, and they do not breed with outsiders. Uh, no, in most cases, you, know, you might say, hey, I went to Quebec and found a wife, and, I'm um, happy and now um, you know, um, most of cases. A mutation that affects all individuals in evidence of found the effect form a uh, common ancestor. So a mutation like carrot it will affect most of the uh, organisms in there. What is population bottleneck? The best example is in the cheetah population. So how many members of the population die? New population has more restricted gene pool and some uh, variant, I guess this uh, will uh, diminish colonizing islands. Cheetahs are genetically very much alike, and I'll tell you why. Jewish population have survived many uh, massacres and so on and so forth. So that is, could be 
here is a population of a cheetah. They genetically, they are very much alike. If we, are, we human are concerned with their population, if a disease comes, they all can be wiped out, okay? So this is a bottleneck effect. So at the beginning, uh, let's say with cheetah population, they had a great variety, right? Something happened. A lot of them died, right here, it's called bottleneck. Something happened, a lot of them died, and just a few species survived. Now, those few species are breeding among themselves, right? Of course, they cannot breed in with any, they cannot breed with tigers. Okay, so that's what's happening. Now they're breeding among themselves. And this is not a, uh, an example of a genetic drift. Okay, this is called bottleneck effect. It is like genetic drift, but some kind of natural disaster. The genetic drift, it means they migrate in an area and they, pop, uh, they breed among themselves. Okay, so now you know bottleneck. How does mutation contribute to variation? Again, that is an ongoing discussion in biology forever and ever and ever. A continual source of genetic variation in the population. Of course, genetic variability can occur by crossing over independent assortment during meiosis. Natural selection eliminates um, alleles that are having problems. Uh, anyhow, all populations have some alleles uh, that will be harmful in the zygotes. Okay, uh, genetic load is collection of harmful alleles in the population, of course. Here is a mutation. So if um, <clears throat> uh, the uh, uh, triangular and the diamond, they mutate and become square, guess what? This population will have more square than the others, okay? And then of course, they're gonna breed among themselves. So, <clears throat> so there, there would be more squares also when they breed among themselves. So that was the diagram of showing you the mutation. How does natural selection play a, uh, play a role? Natural selection has the greatest influence on genetic variability. I already talked about that. Environmental changes can alter allele frequency. Individuals with certain phenotype have uh, alleles more likely to survive. Uh, we talked about that um, a lot. So survival of the fittest, uh, what the fittest means here, it does not mean they can survive in the environment, uh, it's used in English language by misconception a lot, survival of the fittest, survival of the fittest. But what that, what that means fit, it means they can reproduce again. Those individuals can reproduce again, they are the fittest. Okay, I hope I made some sense. Means their reproductive success. Uh, losing a trait, negative natural selection, artificial selection is controlled breeding such as crops, fancy pets, horses. So uh, natural selection cannot reproduce, so they are eliminated from the population and the population becomes like this. No, uh, no uh, squares anymore because they cannot reproduce. Diseases and natural selection, tuberculosis, uh, disease can kill human before reproductive age and impair uh, fertility. Some people inherit <clears throat> their resistance to infectious diseases. As I said, HIV, we have some people can survive it, uh, but some people die over it. The deadliest bacteria is still club a negative population, and those which survive are positive selection. Yeah, these are all. What is a gene flow? So is a transfer of all of the alleles in to the, uh, into or out of the population because of fertile organisms. Today's human population, uh, gene flow is more than before. So human population is becoming more genetically different as a whole. So this is for uh, what is species 
uh, what is species and what is population definition of species varies and they include several criteria. When I was a uh, freshman, uh, took biology classes, my professor came to the class and he said, um, you know, there is no, not a good definition for species. Still, after all these years, we still do not have a good definition for species. We have a population, we have a definition for population. Population is all of the uh, same species. They can breed among themselves and they have offsprings similar to themselves. And those offsprings can multiply as well. But if you, for example, let's take a population, horses and uh, donkeys, if you, if you cross them, they can have an offspring, that offspring becomes mule, as you know. The mules cannot reproduce anymore. So there is no population. But population of horses we have, populations of donkeys we have, you crossbreed them, then you cannot have a um, population anymore. Um, so definition of species varies. Okay, here are some spe um, characteristics of species. Uh, the one that are listed here, you guys, they are characteristics of species. Members uh, descend from a common ancestral population from a lineage, of course. Interbreeding occurs with a species, within a species, but not among different species, reproductive barriers. And then genotypes and phenotypes within a species is similar and abrupt differences occur between different species. Reproductive barriers, there are two general types, uh, uh, pre-mating and post-mating barriers, uh, important factors in uh, forming new species, speciation, and then if uh, driving population uh, reunite before they, they are isolated, interbreeding maintains one species. Evolution of driving population requires they can be kept physically separate. I have a diagram here, geographical isolation and gradual. All right, yeah, great. Okay, so this is what I was talking about. So, as I said, we do not have a good definition for species, but we have a semi decent definition for speciation. Okay, this is not a bad definition for speciation. It is, of course, not knowing the definition of species, but origin of a new species, you're talking about speciation. You remember the beginning of uh, the PowerPoint, I told you organic speciation. Now you're getting to a little bit of nuts and bolts of it with all of that introduction, well, all of that important information, not introduction, you're getting to um, a little bit of what it is. So origin of a new species involved reproduction isolation. Involved reproduction isolation. In an island, assume, assume in an island you have these species and they are breeding among themselves, being happy jolly dog. Then what happens, something happens, either the island breaks or the wind comes or the predator comes, something happens, some of them separate and they go in here and they multiply for themselves. And then of course, some of them go in here or some of them stay in the, uh, I, uh, in the island and they breed among themselves, okay? Now, over a period of time, these guys might change. Let's assume they changed. And over a period of time, these guys did not change at all. When they come, together, somehow, some way, they are brought together. There are two possibilities. One, they can breed and have offsprings and the offsprings are gonna be different. Or they cannot breed anymore. Those two, because they modified so much, the DNA is so different, they cannot breed among themselves any. Okay, so I give you a couple of examples. Um, for example, the uh, horses and uh, horses and uh, donkeys, when they breed, they can have offsprings, but the offsprings cannot breed anymore. The other one, human and apes, we cannot breed with them. 
we modify it so much that we cannot read. Uh, I'm giving you some examples that we can read. It. Evolve different species, state the same, and then uh, if they need, they're going to, what did I say? If they're going to, going to be a different species or uh, what happens, um, and then I have a link for you guys here, a YouTube link, you can watch it and enjoy it on the bottom. I want speciation. Are different species involved? Allo okay, so there are three different type of uh, new species evolve. Okay, one of them is allopatric speciation, different homeland. And they, I gave you a, uh, I'm not going to read all of this to you guys, uh, but uh, allele, it means different, alloy, it means different. Uh, so uh, the geographical areas are called, uh, they were separated, and uh, so they cannot breed anymore. Then you have allopatric again. I give you a link to watch this. Please watch it. Uh, founder effect could be. And then you have non-allopatric. Uh, they call it sympatric, same homeland. So they were separated in the same homeland. And then um, they eventually they uh, evolved to different species. He is giving you examples of uh, sympatric, and throughout the semester, we talked about parasites may evolve in their host. You remember the lice? We talked about lice. Some lice uh, in human body, they evolve so specifically, either your head louse or the body louse or pubic lice. So they are within the same species, and that is an ex example of symp uh, sympatric speciation. Okay, so anyhow. And in the case of plants, it's polyploidy. You study that in bio one uh, when the chromosomes uh, add up. Okay, parapatric, there is a third one. I said there are three of them. Your textbook does not emphasize on this one, but this is most likely happens in plants. Okay, I don't know any example in animals, uh, but parapatric species, when uh, the grass on the same land, the, the wind takes them uh, and they evolve with it same origin of species, a little bit, uh, some, some small variation. Darwin evolutionary evidences, adaptive radiation. I talked about that throughout the semester, adaptive radiation. So I'm not gonna uh, mention it in here. Please read it. Make sure you're familiar with it um, as part of uh, the final. Gradualism, something that uh, other scientists would argue with Darwin that Darwin theory of gradualism is based on the accumulation of small changes over time, uh, which led to different major forms of life. The accumulation of quantitative changes lead to quantitative, um, uh, uh, qualitative changes. And that's what some argue. They say, no, not always it was gradual. Evolution could happen very fast, very rapidly at times as well. And here they are, I'll let you. Uh, read that. Natural selection, I think we talked about this uh, for a good amount of time, what it is, uh, what is the survival of the fittest means, uh, five observations, he influences that, oh, sorry, sorry, let's go back. Because what Darwin, he made three observations right here, and then based on three observations, he made one conclusions, one inferences, and then he made two other observations here, and combination of these two observations with that one, he came, he came up with this inferences, with this conclusion. And based on this conclusion, he came up with natural selection. So please read it. Uh, make sure you're familiar with it, you understand it a little bit. Natural selection, again, we are showing you this uh, challenges of natural selection, orthogenesis. It means the theory that variation in evolution follow a particular direction and are not merely sporadic and accidental. That is, uh, that's the challenge. Okay, so uh, does nature have a goal? Uh, not clearly. We human always like to make things, make sense out of things. But does nature try to do the same thing or not? That's the question. 
directed variation has momentum that uh, forces lineage involved in uh, so weaknesses of Darwin theory please read those and make sure you know what they are um, and um, August Wiseman he um, he put the uh, Mendel's laws and Darwin's uh, findings together, we call it new Darwinism or synthetic theory of evolution, which is next. Okay, emergence of modern Darwinism, the synthetic theory of evolution, and that's what I would like, uh, modern synthesis, and that's what this is. Okay, microevolution coming to the end, almost genetic variation and changes. He's talking about macroevolution. Uh, is the next big talk. Well, I'm not gonna elaborate on too much, but evolution on large scale, that's called macroevolution. And that means extinction. If you have big changes all of the sudden, not gradualism, then that is macroevolution. All of everything that I talked about so far, mutation and genetic drift and everything else I talked about, uh, they are microevolution. Of course, over a period of time, this microevolution becomes big, but macroevolution, you have extinction, a lot of them die, and then these new species quickly can uh, flourish and evolve. Origin of new structures, designs, trends, and masses, the combination of macroevolution and macroevolution factor expands on the Darwin sphere of evolution. So polymorphism, a different alleles form a different genes, gene pool. I gave you the allelic frequency of dominance. We talked about all of these. And genetic equilibrium, um, that's where Hardy-Weinberg equation comes into the picture. Remember, uh, P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equal to one, I'll talk about that. So there are some, your textbook gave you um, example of uh, albinism, uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, your textbook gave you a number that is not forty one rank formula p square rk. Okay. Uh, he is giving you a number that you need to calculate. But the ones that I give you, uh, same as the ones that I give you in bio one, you do not need a calculator. Uh, like forty nine out of ten thousand people, or you know, you can square root of forty nine seven or uh, 16 out of 10,000 people, square root of 16 is uh, four, is that right? Okay, but anyhow, or nine, square root of nine is three, something like that. Um, Eliminating bad recessive allele is nearly impossible by natural selection. So uh, selection is act express the real persist over time mating is random uh, with respect to whether uh, individuals carry a lethal allele or not. Okay, this is what I discussed at, at the beginning, how genetic equilibrium is upset, random genetic drift, non-random, uh, uh, mating, uh, recurring mutations, migration, natural selection, these are all that uh, we can upset uh, genetic drift. I wanna talk about, uh, again, I'm talking about genetic drift, bottleneck, I'm revisiting them. Uh, we already talked about all of these. I did um, interactions of selection drifts and migrations so you guys can study this. Here is a nice diagram telling you all about differences. Microevolution, changes within species, stabilizing, directional and disruptive. Yeah, this diagram shows you a little bit of it. Okay, macroevolution, the large scale events in organic evolution as seen in the fossil records, patterns, um, and processes can emerge from those of microevolution, but they acquire some degree of uh, autonomy. And then speciation links microevolution to macroevolution. Uh, the Gould, Jay Gould, uh, 
he said that uh, tears, there are tears of evolution. And of course, I would like you to know these three, three tiers of evolution. The first year, tens of thousands of years for a population genetic process. So that is us. We human are in the first tier. Second tier is millions of years of uh, speciation and extinctions like uh, uh, punctuated equilibrium concepts. And the third one, the third tier, tends to uh, hundreds of millions of years uh, with uh, episodic mass extinctions. So having said that, If you go to the uh, speciation and extinction through geological time, very important uh, a species has two possible fates, either become extinct or give rise to a new species. And that's what's gonna happen to us humans. Either we are gonna go extinct or of course, millions of years, you know, to one, one to 10 million years. But the way we human are dealing with ourselves and with the environment, I don't know, it can happen faster than that. So, uh, so either we are gonna become extinct, we human, or what happens, we give rise to a new species, okay? So speciation and extinction rate vary among species. A lineage with a high speciation and low extinctions produce a, 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 the greatest diversity. Uh, speciation, uh, species selection is different survival and uh, multiplication of the species uh, based on variation among uh, lineage, uh, properties includes uh, mating rituals and so on and so forth. So I let you. Okay, so we had great extinctions throughout the history of uh, Earth, but there are a couple of them. I would like you to know uh, Permian extinctions, which I will describe it here in a minute. And of course, Cretaceous extinction. Those two, I would like you to know something about them. Uh, they, they are the greatest extinctions. Of course, the uh, Cretaceous is the most recent one, um, extinctions. So here they are, mass extinctions, periodic events that were large numbers of taxa co extinct. Mass extinctions uh, appears to occur uh, every 26 million, uh, five have been traumatic and causes an evolutionary times of base of okay. So what it is, um, this is very important. I would like you to know. So th the most accepted theory is the bombardment by comets uh, and asteroids that cause uh, the extinctions at, uh, of the dinosaurs, okay? Massive temperature fluctuations, that is the one also, and biological force like diseases that is hard to prove if dinosaurs were diseased by some kind of bacteria or virus or something like that. Um, so those are the three um, theories out there. And the most accepted one is number one, bombardment by comets and asteroids. Study of long-term changes in animal diversity focuses on this uh, longest. Okay, that's what I was talking about. Uh, all of those uh, major extinctions, uh, two of them I would like you to know, the Permian, uh, Permian uh, extinctions, which happened 245 million years ago, half of the families of shallow water invertebrates and 90% of the marine invertebrates are disappeared. Okay, so. And then the Cretaceous uh, uh, extinctions happened 65 just recently, and guess what? Our dinosaurs disappear. Okay, so at first, the invertebrates were on the land, and over a period of time, the vertebrate appears, and they, uh, they create vertebrates that they disappeared, it was the dinosaurs, and that was during uh, Cretaceous extinctions that happened 65 million years ago. And then mark the end of the dinosaurs and many marine invertebrates and small uh, reptilian groups. And then selective discrimination of certain biological traits by mass extinctions events uh, is termed as catastrophic species uh, speciation. Yes. That was after the 
after the um, what happened. The dinosaurs, since they were great, they were huge, they used a lot of resources, they preyed on everything, and so on and so forth. So they were gone. What happened to mammals? The mammals were smaller and they flourish on the planet Earth. So like rise of mammals that were able to use the variable resources and due to the dinosaurs extinctions called active radiation. The uh, Chick, uh, Chickaloops, uh, that's the asteroid they are saying that uh, came and uh, caused the, uh, the, the weather to be cloudy for so many years. And then as a result of that, the dinosaurs passed away. And here's a Chickaloop. I would like you to know that. I would like you to know that uh, Chickaloop, Chickaloop asteroid, the name of it and the impact of it. That should mark the end of this. Uh, and if you have any question, please let me know. Um, we'll go over the material. All right. So, here.